All right, let's welcome in Michael Porter Jr. Mike, what's up, man? How are you doing? What's going on, man? I appreciate you having me on the show. Definitely, definitely. You're, you're, we always kind of send out tweets like, who should we have on the show next? Your name that comes up very often. Frequently. Yeah. Frequently. So, um, yeah, uh, no, it does. It does. Every, everybody wants me to get Luke on, but yeah, Luke is an, Luke is an asshole and he, he doesn't want to do it. So <laughs> whatever. <laughs> no, man. Appreciate you guys. Denver fans go hard. Yeah, man. I'm not going to lie. Like before I got drafted, Denver was the last spot that I was even thinking I was going to go. Once I got here and I realized how good the fan base is, how good the city is. Like I love them. My, my brother has lived in Denver now for five or six years. And, uh, so I get to visit him quite a bit in the summer. Um, I went last fall, um, to play some golf with him. Denver's a dope city, man. It's awesome. Let me know what you're out here to get you on my show. All right. We'll do it. We'll do it. I, we, you brought it up. We should mention it. Um, you got your own podcast, Curious Mike. Uh, what was sort of the motivation to, to start your own podcast? Yeah. I mean, you know how it goes, bro. Like as an athlete, um, a lot of times when you tweet, or you Instagram something, people are like, or about something important going on in the world, people are just like, shut up and hoop, you know what I mean? So that happened to me a couple of times, you know, I kind of got in trouble a couple of times for some things I would tweet or talk about. Um, and so, you know, for a while, it kind of drove me away from social media, but I always wanted to find a way to, to be able to talk about things or touch on certain topics um, without people being able to take your things out of context or, you know, just let them have the whole you know, thought behind what you're talking about. So I thought a podcast would be the way to go. Just get people on there that I, you know, I respect um, and that I can talk to about certain things. So even if it's not the same stuff that I necessarily agree with, it's cool to have different views and perspectives and just have real conversations. Tommy and I talk about this all the time. There's, There's not a lot of nuance on social media. And the beautiful thing about a podcast is that it's long form. And so you can get into some nuances with some things. Um, I actually was, when I, I was thinking about, you know, you starting a pod today and my first qu- sort of question is like the, as a young player over the last two years, um, how difficult has it been to be asked so many difficult questions, whether it's the social justice stuff, the COVID stuff, the, the bubble return, the, the vaccination yeah. stuff. It just seems like all of a sudden, and, it, and it, you know, I'm, I'm 15 years in, and I've never in my career have had to deal with speaking on political and social issues like I've had to do the last two years. Now, you, we've always had the choice to do that, but we, it, right. it seems like it's like an obligation, like there's a pressure to do it now. And I can't imagine going through that as a young player. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, these two years... I've been doing interviews for a while since high school, but I mean, obviously it's a lot different once the platform gets bigger, but in one sense, I look at it as it's kind of cool that people respect our opinion enough to ask about our thoughts on certain things and us to be able to answer them. But in another sense, it's like, it is really hard because we're not experts in all these different areas. So if you say one wrong thing, it's like people are just gonna talk crazy about you. And then with the way social media is, if you say one wrong thing, it's going to spread like a wildfire. And now all these people have this perception of you and, you know, which might not necessarily be true. But um, another thing I think is just all these events that have kind of happened with the social justice, the COVID it's like worldwide events. I don't know if there's ever been this many, just like worldwide issues going on in such a brief period of time. So, um, you know, I just try to give some thought to my answers, knowing that they're going to come up. And then if people like it, then that's cool. If they don't, I just really don't care anymore. Mike, I was going to transition to the basketball stuff for a second. Speaking of the bubble, it's where you really made, you know, a pretty significant jump. Obviously, just sort of like, you know, you're in this very early stage of your career. What are some of your bubble uh, memories like, you know, now looking back at it like a year later? Yeah, I mean, well, the bubble was a pretty, pretty, like you said, a big jump for me. But what's crazy about that is I actually kind of made that jump going into the bubble. Like I actually had COVID right before the bubble. So I got to the bubble like a month late um, and I was working out harder than I probably ever have while I had COVID. Um, And so then going into the bubble, I, I was just locked and loaded. And then, you know, I had some it was kind of like a fresh start in the bubble because the coach coaches were trying to try new uh, lineups and everything. And I just 
was rolling those first few games. So then I finally got some real playing time into the playoffs. Um, then that was my first taste of the playoffs, and it's a completely different brand of basketball. Um, but it was – I mean, there's so many memories. Like, as, as tough as it was being there during that time, like, those are lifelong memories that none of us will ever forget because we got to be closer with our teammates than we would ever be. We got to hang with them, you know, at the pool or just eating food. Like, it was it was very strange, but in, in a way it was like – I look back at it and all I remember is the good times. Yeah, the bubble, b- besides the part about missing my family, uh, the bubble was awesome. Like, it was like summer camp for adults. It felt like an awesome AAU tournament for some reason. Yeah. All of yeah. the shit aside that was going on in the country at the time, I don't want to take, <laughs> I don't want to say I wasn't worried about all that shit, but just in terms of like being in one place, which we never get to do as NBA players, being in one place having like this really set schedule, you know, we're basically playing every other day. There's light practices in between. We got our sleep. We weren't traveling. Like it was an awesome experience for me, family aside, of course. I want to mention, by the way, your splits in the bubble. So you, you ended up playing in seven of the regular season games uh, and you averaged 22 and nine on 70% uh, true shooting, uh, which is just phenomenal. Was there something besides just working out hard? Was there something that clicked uh, for you in the bubble? I mean, I think it was it was for me having those months. Like for me, every single year since my big injuries, like my surgeries, the more time that I've had since my surgeries, the more I've kind of gotten back into feeling like myself. Um, so then going down there, I was just really locked in. You know, there was no distractions down there. Us as NBA players, like that's another thing about the bubble dudes go out dudes drink whatever like in the bubble all there was no girls anything it was just basketball so for me it was like I was getting my sleep getting my nutrition I felt my body felt pretty good and it was just like the rest was just being confident in my abilities the coaches really just kind of saw how hard I worked because like back here in Denver they don't see how much you go to the gym at night or all this extra work you do in the bubble they know if you're in the gym at night. They knew if you were staying after practice to get extra shots every day. So they kind of showed a different level of trust in me. And uh, it was just – it was easier to build kind of quick with the coaches. I look back uh, at sort of the the turning point in my career. It happened a little bit later for me. It was it was our playoff run in 2009 when we made the NBA Finals um, and getting to go through that playoff run and start eight of those games and guard Ray Allen for an entire series like – it was a huge turning point in terms of making me feel like I belonged, making me feel like I could play at this level. Um, and you had this huge jump this year in your second year playing your third year in the league, but this huge jump this year. Uh, do you look back and think, well, the bubble is like where I established myself and that gave me the momentum going forward? I mean, for me, man, like, like I feel like, you know, I had those big injuries, but for me, it's always been in my mind that I was going to be – a really good player one day. So like, even when I wasn't getting a lot of playing time or all that stuff that rookies go through, I never lost uh, hope or faith that I kind of like break through that and get it going. I just knew it was going to be a matter of of when. And so like the bubble, it was awesome timing, but it wasn't necessarily very surprising to me. Um, And then going into this year, I just kind of carried that momentum. But even this year, man, like, I know a lot of players, when they get to the NBA, I say this all the time, like you can separate yourself because a lot of players get to the NBA and their goal is to enjoy the lifestyle or the money or whatever it brings. My goal was always to be like as good of a player as I could be. And I knew after my injuries, it was going to be even harder. So I've stayed locked in. So like even this year, having success a little bit this year, it's like I don't even feel close to accomplishing what I feel like I can accomplish with my potential. You know what I mean? I think that's a fantastic mentality to have. And I, and I think you're spot on in saying that there, there is a way to separate yourself from the NBA. And that's like embracing the process, embracing the grind, trying to get better every day. Uh, We talk about that a a ton on the show. Um, I want to, I want to sort of jump backwards a little bit. Because I didn't realize this until I was doing research for the show, but you and Trey Young played on the same AAU team in high school. Yeah. Was what was he like back then? Was he was he the villain and the troll that he is now at times? Man, so the crazy thing about Trey is like his game hasn't changed at all since then, and his personality hasn't changed at all. Like the way he 
he'll make a shot and then bow to the crowd or do all this little slick stuff. He's always been like a little, a little trickster out there. So, I mean, he's literally the exact same player. He, he does the same moves, same shots. Obviously, he's gotten bigger and a little bit stronger. But Trey's always been like one of the best players. And I've always said, um, I mean, he was ranked like 30th, I think. But he was, every point guard he played against, he was always killing him. And I think that, you know, analysts look at how high you can jump or how, you know, that they, they take that and view that as athleticism. But like Trey's change of speed and his IQ, it's always been, it's always been there. Like it hasn't changed at all. So you knew you knew even back then that he could reach this level of being an all-star and an all-NBA type player. I knew so so this thing with Trey, like we played high school together, AAU together, and like on that team, he had the keys, I had the keys. So we both just could shoot tough shots, make tough shots. Then we go to play with Team USA, and there's players like Markel Fultz, like all these other players that also played point guard, and Trey averaged like two points a game because he didn't have the keys. So when, we, when he was talking to me about colleges to go to, I told him, like, bro, just make sure you go to a school where you can be you and the coach gives you the keys, lets you do whatever you want. Because when he can do whatever he wants and shoot from half court, he's unbelievable. But when he has to have a ton of other players who are kind of ball dominant players, it's, it's not going to be the same for him. So every level he's played at, Trey has gotten that. And that's why he's just excelled so well and like, because he's one of those superstar type players that he's going to take some crazy shot. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think it goes into just freedom. Like I, the, the, the best I played in my career was when I was on teams with coaches that gave me freedom to just be me, you know, exactly. um, you know, and, and like coach K back at Duke, I used to watch Pazer Stojakovic when he played for the Kings. He would shoot threes in transition. And like that was not a thing back then. People would right. run for layups. But like I did that in high school. And so when I got to Duke, I told Coach I want to do that. He was like, let it fly. If that's a layup to you, go get it. Yeah, exactly. No, no, you're spot on. Like, And I, I tell people uh, all the time, like there's so many NBA players who if you put them into like a regular run or even a run with other pros, they're going to look amazing. But then they go back to their team and they kind of have this stigma that they got to fill this certain role and they're not going to look that good. But a lot of the NBA is about freedom and just opportunity. It's like crazy how much that is. And then also, you know, the confidence because you got to build into that role. But um, a lot of it is, like you said, the freedom. Like when uh, when you were growing up, at what point do you feel like uh, you started to sort of make the jump to where the the NBA seemed like a realistic possibility. And then my follow-up to that is also with your family and the amount of basketball talent in your family, like what were, what were just like playing around like in the backyard like? Because your family is pretty insane in terms of, you know, what you got, what your siblings, yeah. you know, how they play. So, yeah, I'll answer the, the, first, the second part of that question first. So, yeah, I got seven brothers and sisters. Um, and all of us, from my sisters down, we'll probably all end up playing D1 basketball. I'll probably have two or three brothers that end up playing in the NBA with me at the same time. My mom and dad played college basketball. Um, so we it was always a part of me since really early. Um, and, you know, we just we, – we were homeschooled, so we would do a subject of school, go in the backyard, shoot, go, come do another subject, go in the backyard, work out. Like, that gave me a big jump. Um, ahead of some of my peers at first. And then I remember a specific time in fifth grade. JJ knows, you, you probably played AAU, but uh, I was sitting in AAU Nationals in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and like all of us were in there. Um, and there was a speaker that came and he was just saying like, man, there'll be like one or two of you from this room. There was like 500 kids who might make the NBA. So you guys need to go try to find a backup plan. And I remember that so vividly because that's the time I was like, I'm going to be one of those NBA players. And like looking back in that room, even just on my team, there's like two or three dudes who are now in the NBA. And in that room, there's probably 15 dudes. So like, I don't know what that dude was talking about, but that was the conversation <laughs> that made me think like, nah, I'm going to the league. And then I remember getting ranked for the first time in like eighth grade. And then I kind of saw like, okay, like I can – Still get better, better, better. Um, and then, yeah. You know what's so funny about that? First of all, 
What a shitty public speaker. I'm going to say that. Like, <laughs> way to inspire some dreams in some kids or something. Man. Like, come on, man. Don't be such a Debbie Downer. I had the exact same experience in my first AU Nationals. I was really? at, tw- at 12 and under. We were in Salt Lake City and Greg Ostertag. Yeah, I'm shitting on Greg Ostertag because he came to the gym on the opening night and he talked to 800 kids or 1,000 kids, however many it was. And he was like, it's a good chance no one in here makes it. It's a better chance like one of y'all makes it. So but yeah, it, I, mean, I assume it wasn't Greg Ostertag that gave you the speech. Maybe AAU just tells the speakers to say this shit. But I'm yeah. like, I'm thinking to myself, oh man, like this guy just killed my dream. Like I'd love to play in the NBA, but I guess, I guess the odds are really, really stacked against me. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man. Yeah, that's that's my story. Same story. I love, I love, by the way, I, I love talking to guys about <clears throat> just their belief in themselves at such a young age. Yeah. Because like I because I like I I did not have that belief. I mean, I, I thought I was good and like by eighth grade, I was like, all right, I'm a I'm gonna play high D one. Um, I'm gonna be good enough because I had grown and I was like six three and a guard. I'm like, I'm good enough, you know, whatever. But like to think at eleven, like I'm gonna play in the NBA is just such a it's just such an insane sort of mentality to me. And so I'm just I I'm always in awe of guys when they tell me that. Yeah, it's 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 strange because like we well we ended up winning nationals so I knew we were the best team in the country and then like I was one of the best players and I knew just my work ethic so like I I literally can tell you I never had a doubt that I'd be in the NBA one time like no doubt since as young as I can remember like that was my only plan like I had no plan b and like for you you probably until you like went to Duke and people saw how amazing you were at shooting the basketball like you probably didn't necessarily have all the, you know, rah rah. Around. I don't know. Were you ranked in high school and things like that? I, I mean, I was McDonald's game MVP, but <laughs> ah, never mind. Don't, good. You don't 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 go down this road. <laughs> don't go down this road. This is a bad path. <laughs> ah, you knew that. So you already knew. Nah, that. man. Nah, I just. I, I just I, it was like one of those. Cause so, so you saying at eleven I'm gonna be in the league was like me saying at eight I'm gonna play for Duke. Cause until I got to Duke, like I was, I was just like so focused on being a Duke basketball player and going right. to Duke. Um, so it was a little different. And then once I, once, once my junior year happened, like I was like, all right, I'm gonna play in the league. I just, you know, I hope, I hope it, uh, you know, I end up in the right situation. I can have a long career or whatever. Um, uh, speaking of college, um, you came out in 16 or 17, your uh, high school class, your high school class, my, was- my, uh, 2017. 2017. So if, if you were if you were coming out of high school now, would you consider going to college or would you do like overtime elite in high school or G League elite? Like what what would your decision making be like given the current options for players of your caliber coming out of high school? Yeah, I mean, right now, I think just because they like I remember, like I uh, I just saw that they let the college kids get the money now based off of their likeness. So I think right now, if it was the same thing. I'd probably uh, end up going to college, trying to make some money based off of my likeness and then uh, go to the NBA because I wanted the college experience. And I also, I think it's important for kids to have a year of learning besides high school, high school basketball. So like just shoot whatever shot, do whatever you want. College is a lot more structured. So I think I would have known that, tried to go to college. But if it was like it was back then where you couldn't make any money and you could make the jump to the NBA, I would have gone to the NBA for sure because, I mean, you know how it is. A lot of these players that go to the NBA, like, their families have no money. So, like, if you had the choice to go make a million dollars, you're going to probably want to do that instead of go to college, even if it's not the smartest thing to do. Yeah, no, I think – I still think guys should be able to go to the NBA out of high school. And if you – I mean, we've talked about this a ton, but if you look at what has happened to college basketball over the last 15 or 16 years, the product's not as good as it was pre-2005 because of that. Um, where, right. did you homeschool through like all through high school or did you stop at a certain point? So I was homeschooled all the way until eighth grade. Then I went to public school. Okay. Um, then I went to private school for three years. Then I ended up going out to Seattle for public school and played under Brandon Roy. He was my coach. Yep. I remember my that. Student. So, yeah. Um, no, cause I, the only reason I'm asking is cause I was also homeschooled. I, I did homeschool till fifth grade and then I did fifth grade public school and went 
you know, same public school system till I graduated. But homeschooling is it was like it was kind of awesome, but also kind of weird. I mean, how was your experience <laughs> going to school and like being around normal kids? Were you kind of weird at first? <laughs> yeah, it was super weird. I didn't know how to act. I did exactly. not know how to act. I, mean, I was like, right. I was leaving notes in girls' desks, like when I would go to math <laughs> class, and like I would get in trouble for that. Like, I just I didn't know how to like socially behave because like the only the only friends I had up until that point were other homeschool kids, and thankfully I had played like one year of of like youth sports, so I had gotten to be around normal kids. But yeah, I mean, I. I my, my sisters did it till ninth grade and they're like still super weird. They're still super <laughs> exactly. weird. <laughs> so, yeah. They, when people ask me if I recommend it, I always say like, are you okay with your kid being a little, you know, sheltered? Because when I went to school, it was the same way I went to school in eighth grade. And I'm like, whoa, kids are doing that this early. Like I had no idea because all my yeah. friends were basketball friends. So my parents ended up, the way they got us out of that is they bought a snow cone stand and like made us run it and talk to strangers. And that's kind of how we learned how to talk to people <laughs> and because we were just like, it was, we was homeschooling, you know? That's awesome. So, that, that is that, awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I would, my mom would like, uh, I don't know. Did you have like a structured day? Cause like my brother, my little brother had to have a little more structure to his day. Cause that's just how his personality is. Like my yeah. mom would have to put structure on him, but like with me, like we would get up, we'd have breakfast, and then she said, "All right, start your school." And whenever you're done, you can go play. And so I would just do my daily lessons. I'd do my math worksheets or whatever. I'd read thirty pages of whatever book I had to read. And then, like eleven, eleven thirty, I would just go out and hoop in the backyard for literally the rest of the day. It was great. Yeah, I mean that's how it was with us. But our mom was so chill. Even if we were like, <clears throat> "Mom, can we please just not do it today and do two lessons tomorrow?" She'd be like, "All right, you can, you can, you can chill." So like. Our school took two hours, literally. And the crazy thing is, like, I don't know if it was like this for you. Once I finally went to public school, I was still ahead of all the kids. That, like, I was still yes. smarter than them or, like, yes. more ahead. And it was weird because I only did school a couple hours a day. So that tells me, I mean, they're teaching. In public school, they go at the slowest kids rate. And in homeschool, it's like as soon as you understand yep. it, you can move on. So. Well, my mom had started me early. So when I was nine and a half, this was like around Christmas. I was nine and a half and in fifth grade homeschool. And she tried to put me in the public school system, sixth grade, like junior high. I was nine and a half and the yeah. public school system was like, no, 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 no. He's got to go finish fifth grade homeschool, then do fifth grade public school. So I actually did fifth grade twice, which is kind of weird, but I, I, yeah. I had the same experience. I got to school and I was like, man, this is easy. My homeschooling was harder than this. Exactly. Hey, Tommy, is your butt clean enough to sit on the couch naked? No? Well, then get a Tushy, the modern bidet that attaches directly to your toilet in under 10 minutes. Tushy is the modern bidet for people who poop. Just poop, wash, and pat dry. There are so many reasons to get a Tushy. Tommy, list some of them off. Well, JJ, washing your butt with water gives you a better clean than toilet paper, and it's less irritating and more soothing. It's also easy to install as there's no electricity or plumbing needed. And lastly, it reduces your toilet paper use by 80%, saving you money. Amazing. Tushy also has a full product line to help make the restroom the best room, including a Tushy Ottoman to help you poop, a Tushy brush, and more. So start washing with the Tushy bidet for a better clean. Go to hellotushy.com slash three. That's T-H-R-E-E. HelloTushy.com slash three to get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer for our listeners at HelloTushy.com slash three for 10% off. After you buy and install your Tushy, show it off. Tag us at HelloTushy on Instagram. Have you ever wanted to learn how to box or kickbox from real fighters? Do you want to get your kids involved in a fitness journey with you while teaching them a valuable skill? Well, Fight Camp brings the boxing and kickboxing gym right to your home with full body workouts that you'll actually look forward to, plus a free standing punching bag that can take your hardest hits. Fight Camp is made for everyone from beginners to experienced boxers who want to box from home with several different paths you can follow that teach you skills and pair them with workouts to reinforce your new learnings. There's also new content being released weekly that cover a range of easy to advanced. It comes with all the gear you need to box at home, including a freestanding punching bag, boxing gloves, quick hand wraps, and their unique punch tracking sensors, which allow you to track your boxing 
and Kickboxing Journey so you can see all the progress you're making. Learn from six highly qualified trainers, all with real fight experience. You're a big boxing guy, Tommy. I am. How do you like Fight Camp? I love it. I'd strongly recommend. You can pay for your Fight Camp over 24 months for less than the cost of a boxing gym and get it right away. Plus, Fight Camp offers free shipping with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to joinfightcamp.com slash JJ. Once again, to get free shipping on Fight Camp, go to joinfightcamp.com slash JJ. Joinfightcamp.com slash JJ. It's good to see the teams back out on the gridiron. Lucky for us, that was just week one. DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL, is putting you in the center of the action for week two. New customers can get a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit by signing up using code JJ. Get in on the action now. It's simple. Just pick your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against the competition. Feel the NFL action like never before with a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Download the DraftKings app now and use code JJ. This week, new customers can get a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Enter code JJ to get a free shot at millions in total prizes with your first deposit. That's code JJ only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. A minimum $5 deposit is required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Doesn't it seem like the world's against us from getting a good night's sleep this time of year? Whether it's the warm temps, neighbors parting, which is <clears throat> something I have to deal with, crickets driving you nuts, it can really help to get some solid Z's. But when you have a purple mattress, you can sleep cool and comfortable no matter what the world throws at you. That's because only purple mattresses have the grid. Its unique ventilated design allows air to flow through to help you sleep cool, even when it feels like a thousand degrees out. And the grid is amazingly supportive for your back and legs while cushioning your shoulders, neck, and hips, no matter how you sleep. Unlike memory foam, which remembers everything, the grid bounces back as you move and shift, so you never get that I'm stuck feeling you do with memory foam. It's true, Tommy. I've tried this, and it's incredibly comfortable. Try your Purple mattress risk-free with free shipping and returns. Financing is available, too. Purple is comfort reinvented. Right now, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. Go to purple.com slash JJ and use promo code JJ. That's purple.com slash JJ, promo code JJ. For 10% off any order of $200 or more, purple.com slash JJ, promo code JJ, terms apply. Exactly. Mike, I was going to, I was going to ask you, you were talking about your confidence, the confidence earlier that you, you, you always sort of knew that you were going to be, uh, this level of player, but when the injuries started happening, uh, and it's these bad injuries, you know, these are significant injuries that there's, there even is like some medical debate on, you know, still did that ever, did it ever waver at all? Did you ever have any moments where you're like, I can't control stuff like this? So after my first surgery at Mizzou, I was like, okay, I'll be good. I'm going to rehab for a few months. I'll be okay. Then I rehab, then I'm getting ready for the draft. And then it happened again. I had to get a second surgery. And the second one, like, I was like, yo. Because then that's when the the Clippers had the 12th and 13th pick. And their doctor is the one that did my evaluation. And he wrote up, like, I don't know if this guy will play again. Nobody should take him. So that's why I ended up dropping to 14. Um, and, and the Clippers passed on me twice. I remember after that second surgery, it was like, man, like, okay, at this point, I'm going to rehab as hard as I can, but it's going to be up to God. I think I can do it, but I don't really know for sure. But I'm going I'm to at least give it a sh- my best shot, you know? Um, I, I hate to keep making comparisons between you and I, but I also <laughs> had a herniated disc in my back right before the draft and I was devastated and I thought that I was going to have to rehab and go to Europe and I wasn't gonna get drafted mind you I also simultaneously between the back injury I got a DUI like two days later (laughs) this was like 13 days before the draft so I just remember sitting in jail at like 4 30 in the morning being like man I'm going to fucking Europe this is it's a wrap for me all this hard work I'm going to Europe you had the surgery no I didn't get surgery but I remember at the time they were like, you can get surgery. Because my, my shit was L5-S1. So it's like the the last disc. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a degenerative disc. So like I've I've had it my whole career. Like it, you still won't see any liquid like jelly in that in that MRI of that disc. It just looks dry relative to all the other discs. So they were just like, they put me on this like rehab program, this core program. So I missed like the whole summer, whatever. 
Um, when you when on draft night, like take us through this a little bit. Take us through your mindset, where you thought you were going to be picked, where you were hoping to get picked. Did you get a promise from a team? Did Denver promise you? Like as this is all unfolding, kind of take us through draft night because you were projected to be, you know, prior to the back injury, you know, a, a top two or three pick. Yeah, so I've never really talked about this too in detail, like uh, on on anything like this. But so the whole process was, I had rehab for my first my first surgery that happened in Mizzou. Then I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I didn't go work out for any teams, so I only I just had one pro day. All the teams came to me in Chicago, and I worked out pretty well. I was in some pain, but I thought that was just part of the rehab process. I worked out really good. Sacramento brings me in and is like, yo, like if you if you feel good, we're going to take you with the number two pick. I'm like, bet. That's dope. But my, my agent wanted to have a second pro day just for the top 10 teams because he's like, man, these, these guys are raving about you. Like if you if you do really well, there's a chance you go number one still, even after the surgery. So I'm like, bet. So I'm and that's only two weeks. The, the pro days were a week in, in, uh, in between each other. So I'm getting ready, getting ready. And then two days before I wake up that morning and like all the pain is down my leg. Like it's crazy again. After I had the first surgery, I call my agent. I'm like, yo, like I can't get out of bed, bro. So he tells me, man, the teams are already on their way. Like just let them evaluate you. So I end up for that second pro day, I'm laying on a table and they're all top 10 teams have their doctors there and they're just evaluating me. The guy from the Clippers was the head doctor. Um, and he's the one that wrote the report. It's like, yeah, he probably won't ever play again. So I thought, you know, draft night. And the thing is, like, I wish I had the, the second surgery right then. Because, you know, if you let that thing sit for a while, like pressing on that nerve, then it's going to be a longer recovery if it doesn't heal on its own. So, but the doctor was like, man, let it sit for six weeks. And then we'll go from there. So even at draft night, I hadn't had surgery yet. And I was in so much pain. So I'm sitting there. And even if you get picked at 14, bro, like you, you're there like two hours, like before you get, like before I got picked. So I'm sitting there trying to deal with this pain. And the day before, Mark was like, Mike, I want you to talk to the Nuggets. Um, I just want to get, get you a floor to where you won't go past. And so the Nuggets end up saying like, we don't think he'll be there, but if he's there, we'll take him. First time I talked to Tim Conley, was like the day of the draft. Um, like I didn't even really even think of the Nuggets as like a possibility. And then, you know, got drafted. And I said a draft night um, just for like them believing in me. Like I wanted to be their best draft pick ever. And I was going to work as hard as I could to, to become that. And so I still feel like every year, man, it's like little by little growth. Like I went through a lot. But, you know, it's all God's timing, bro. So I'm blessed to be in the situation I'm in. And I'm blessed to even be playing in the NBA. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I'm not going to sort of put words in your mouth, but I do sense a little bit of bitterness towards the Clippers for passing on you twice. I'm, I want to <laughs> no, ask, ask you, though. I want to ask you, though. I want to ask you, though. Like, as you're going through this moment, are you doing this thing that Paul Pierce just talked about this in his Hall of Fame speech? Like, are you doing this thing where you're like recording in your brain, like searing in your brain, like every team that passes on you? Or did you have the perspective at the time of sort of like, no, I'm, I'm dealing with this back injury. I understand why this is happening. No, I understood it. Um, and I didn't necessarily have any, any, I don't have any bitterness towards any team because I was low key scared myself. Like I didn't know. If I was going to bounce back the way I wanted to either. And it's been a slow process. Like, I still feel like I'm getting there. But, I mean, the Clippers, I mean, to be honest with you, it might have been a God thing. Because who knows? You know how crazy L.A. is. Who knows? Living in L.A. as a rookie, doing just strictly rehab without even playing. I might have got into some stuff. So, it's man, I'm where I'm supposed to be. You you might have got turned. You might have got turned. For <laughs> sure. Turn. What is – what is – I, like I love your mentality and, and listen to you talk, but like, do you have an end game? Do you have like, what is the best version of me? Have you have you thought about that? Visualized that? Wrote that? Written that down? You know, I used to. I used to be like, man, I want to be better than him. I want to be better than him. I want to be the best. Now, for me, it's just like because of the uncontrollable things that have happened to me, it changed my perspective to 
now I'm just getting up every day, trying to be better than I was the day before, and I leave the potential up to God. Like if I'm giving my best every day and making sure my mental game is strong, playing with confidence, I don't want to put a ceiling on myself and say like, oh, if I'm better than him, then I then I will feel like I had success. It's just like no, if I'm working as hard as I can every day, and God continues to keep me healthy, then I'm then I'm good. Because there's been some uncontrollable things. It's like no matter how much core I do, no matter how much whatever I do, it's like something can still happen. So it's like, you know. what, what what was your uh, what was your first uh, impression of uh, Jokic? You first met him. So Jokic, when I first met him, he was fat. Like he's skinnier. Now. <laughs> So I'm like, wait. And then I remember like, well, the first time I met him, he came to the gym when I when I first got to Denver. He came and rebound for me for a little bit. I was like, oh, he's a he's a good guy. But he I didn't really know too much about him because I didn't ever watch the Nuggets. And he wasn't, he was good, he wasn't as good as he is now. And then we went, end up going to training camp and I'm watching him play. And he's doing all right, but like Mason Plumley was doing just as good as a Joker. And I'm like, wait, so why does Joker start over Mason Plumley? And then I remember my teammates just saying, like, no, like, when he wants to, he could score 40 a night. If he didn't just pass and he just wanted to score, I was like, no way, bro. They were like, wait till the season starts. And so we, I waited, and, like, I've never seen anything like him. Just the way he just – it's just weird. Like, he's just a weird dude. He'll just – before the game, he's on his little phone playing games, you know. I think he's starting to take his, his health more serious. But, like, before that, I heard – after the season, he just goes back, drinks beer, rides horses, and then tries to get in shape a couple weeks before the season starts. Like he's just naturally and like amazing. I don't know. JJ, does that sound from like somebody you know? I'm not I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, man. <laughs> Fuck you, Tommy. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I I have seen, by the way, the Nuggets are putting out some amazing Jokic hype video workouts the dude looks in shape he's gonna have another exactly. big season wait, wait, like mike do you know have you have you have you interacted with his brothers man his brothers are like mobsters bro like they <laughs> they're so different than him like he got some but they're like they're, they really like they'll come out on the court and try to fight like almost every other game and they're like i guess they're a big deal back in serbia but they're just like they're so different than joker but they they take care of them they're cool guys I have a I have a sort of question, like in in terms of how you would sort of describe him, like as a guy, as like a teammate, because you know, as good as he is, right, MVP, all that stuff, like as good as he is, like there's just it, there seems to be this shroud of mystery about his personality. Like he'll he'll provide some unintentional comedy, he'll provide some funny quips in in interviews, but what is he what is he like as a teammate? Yeah, I mean, I think he's one of those leaders who doesn't necessarily lead by being vocal all the time. He's just going to lead more by example. Um, and he's starting to take that more serious. I think before he was just a star without necessarily really wanting to be a star. Now he's like, okay, I know how good I am. I know I'm the MVP. Let me help bring these dudes along with me. So the most that I get from Joker is like his consistency, taking care of his body, being in the training room. He's available every game. He, you know, he has his small circle that he sticks to, his brothers. But, I mean, as far as personality, I mean, the dude is just – he's – like, we have some deep conversations sometimes, and I respect his mentality so much because he's more just like – almost like Giannis. Just like take it day by day, game by game. Even if I have a bad game, I'm going to be the same dude. I really don't care that much. If I have a great game, I'm not going to get arrogant. Like, I'm going to be the same dude. Like, so that's what I respect about Joker the most because he just is, he doesn't even view himself as like a superstar. Have you been on the court? We talk about this with, uh, with Luca a lot. And then Giannis as well, when we just had Drew on, where like sometimes they will make plays that every other NBA player on the court is like, what the fuck just happened? Like Luca does it like every like five games. So hit some shot. And everyone's like, I can't believe he just hit that. Has there ever been like a pass or anything like that where you're like, yo, I can't believe that this dude just did that? It's more like as the game goes on and it's down the wire, how he just doesn't change. His emotion doesn't change. He just the hit a buzzer beater. He really doesn't care. Like he never is sped up. Everything is just his game. Like that's the most impressive thing about him. He'll make a buzzer beater or a big shot down the stretch. And it's just like, it's just like it was the first quarter. You know what I mean? He doesn't really feel pressure. Off, do, do you do you feel any 
I guess pressure would be the word, but do you feel any pressure? Do you, do you feel any of that in terms of being the third star in Denver? Obviously the team has built a championship contender, Jamal and, and uh, Jokic have established themselves as stars. And, and with your, your second year here, you're certainly uh, making a case to be a star, but do you feel, do you feel that pressure to be that third guy? Not necessarily in the pecking order, but just in terms of like forming a big three in, in Denver. I mean, more for me is like I no one has higher expectations for me than me. So like I said, even with a little bit of success or whatever, I don't view myself as close to where I want to be. So like that helps me never get too, too high or too low. But I mean, really, we're trying to hold it down until Jamal gets back. You know, what I mean, we have a really good team um, just signed, re-signed Aaron Gordon today. We got a squad, and when Jamal comes back, you know, giving me a whole season to kind of, you know, figure it out even more, I just feel like we're going to be really tough to beat for, for a long time. But, uh, no, nah, I don't think it's pressure to be the third star. I mean, I know people make a, a big deal out of that. I just try to go out there and be Mike and just get better year to year and improve on the things I got to improve on. Has Compazzo ever guarded you in practice? Uh, yeah, I think he guarded me one time, just go, not like one on one. I was going to the rim. I'm thinking I have a layup, and he, and it's the, I'm like, yo, how is his hands that crazy? He's so, that dude gets a million steals. He's a, he's a, he's a pest for sure. I don't know, even remember him having like a huge game in terms of like counting stats, but he is so entertaining to watch. Um, he's got a little flair with the passing. His shot is hilarious. Like it just looks, it looks funny. And then defensively, like he's full tilt. He's a little bit like TJ McConnell, honestly. Just like yeah. full tilt. Uh, he's a, like a gnat. He's just, he's just in your shit and and annoying the shit out of people. Man, but he's he's an extremely good defender. And he brings a lot of energy. So I'm excited for him and Monte to kind of like be the point guards until obviously Jamal comes back. He's fun to play with, though. We we asked this uh, to a bunch of guys, but did you have a uh, like a welcome to the NBA moment with another with an opponent where you're like, okay, I'm here now. You know, this is not this isn't college anymore. Um, I didn't really have it until the bubble because I like my minutes were more like, oh, it doesn't really matter. We're up twenty, we're down twenty. It doesn't really matter. So I just kind of was like, man. I got to try to get a few buckets in the few minutes that I had. Once I started becoming a valuable piece to the team was in the bubble. And I remember we were playing Portland. This was a game that Portland needed to make the playoffs. Um, and Melo had got it in his little mid post area. I was like, damn, I've seen this a million times on TV. Let, let me see if I can guard it. And I'm trying to guard it. And he just does one of the vet moves, a little swing throughs. He gets to the line, but I'm just like, there's, I have a picture of it. I remember posting it on my Instagram. Um, but just guarding Mellow in that mid post area, um, it was probably my welcome to the NBA moment. Love that. I was going to ask with, with the Portland uh, in the series, you know, obviously you guys won this year, but, but with, with how Dame played in that game six, is that what, like, what's going through your mind when that's happening? Because that is, I mean, we've had him on the show, we've talked about it with him a decent amount. But like that's that almost transcends basketball to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, you, you heard what KD said. It was a spiritual experience. I mean, even on the floor, like we just almost started laughing when, when some of his shots went in. We was like, we was just like, you were almost just like, there's no way he just made that. Like two two buzzer beaters in a row that were like crazy. It was just, it was crazy. I mean, he he gave his whole heart to that series. Um, yeah, I mean, I love Dame's uh, his just mentality, but I mean, playing against him, he literally like he was doing some stuff. When I was telling my team, bro, I've never seen that before. Like, I've never seen that ever. I think I think there there was a a, a gif or a meme or a video of something uh, with Austin after one of the shots because Austin, yeah, well, he just, Austin got he a good like, Austin played good D, but he got a good portion of that fifty piece. Like he got a yeah. good portion of that, and there was one shot that he hit going down the stretch, and Austin's just like. Nah, can't he, he, can't trying, he. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mike, this has been awesome. We appreciate the time, man. Everybody, go check out Mike's podcast, Curious Mike, uh, and have a have a great season. Stay healthy, 
and we'll see you soon, man. Man, I appreciate you guys, no doubt.